celebrating the life of a broadcasting legend now on BBC Two with a tribute to John Peel. The programme includes some strong language. Hi, this is quite difficult for me because I'm here to pay tribute tonight to a man who was my musical mentor, kind of spiritual father, and from the Glastonbury years, he was my TV husband, John Peel. Since we heard of the death of John just over a week ago now, it's become apparent that he was, well, he meant an awful lot to an awful lot of people. So we're going to show in half an hour's time a programme that was made for his 60th birthday, The Life of John, and it's called Turn That Racket Down. But first of all, we've been talking over the past seven days or so to a lot of people, just kind of getting their take on John, what he meant to them, why he was so special. He wasn't a saint, but he was a one-off. He was a unique broadcaster. This is our tribute to John. And the Radio 1 transmitters are now closing down until 5 o'clock tomorrow morning, when we'll be joining Radio 2 until 7 o'clock, then DLT will be along with the breakfast show. Mm -hmm. It still doesn't become reality to me. I still feel he's on holiday and he's coming back. You know, he's just got a bit, you know, he's having an extended holiday because I can't accept it. I sit opposite him. I get the feeling that John wasn't ready. You know, none of us were ready. Certainly, why would we be? But I don't think he was either. And I think that makes it quite tough to talk about. You know, I'm like, oh no, 20 years younger than the man. I always thought I'd go before him. He was just one of those people you just always thought would be around. It's like the Ravens at the Tower of London. It's just... BBC ain't the same place anymore. It's not the same without John. Everybody that I've encountered says it's like losing a friend. And that's everybody from the kind of experimental, punk, new wave, rock, reggae kind of area to the people that listen to Home Truths on Radio 4. I mean, it's interesting, you know, the kind of two ends of the social spectrum, and they all have the same thing to say about John Peel. I'm sure everybody in the country felt if they had a problem, they could go and talk to John, they'd, he'd understand it. You know, there was this, this lovely, um, I don't know, empathy with people that he had. I mean, I can't remember anybody in the music industry dying that has caused so, so many people to write so much about one person. And, and that just is a, very much a tribute to John Peel. It's been a hard year, you know, Alistair Cook's gone and Al Peel's gone. You know, it's, uh, it's, we've lost uh, two uh, of the greatest voices to radio in the space of a few months. Really, since I was about 30, I've had no ambitions to do anything other than what I do. So if I dropped dead tomorrow, I couldn't really complain, to be honest. I mean, I hope I don't, you know, because there's going to be like a new Fall LP next year and things like that, you know, and uh, I want to hear that. So it's just been nosiness that keeps me going, thinking, you know, if I stay alive another day, will the man from, uh, you know, the security van turn up with another box of records from some importer in London? You know, it's just babyish stuff like that that keeps me ticking over, really. He stood for integrity and I know you can say pop music doesn't matter but it does matter to an awful lot of people and John represented integrity in that particular world but he he also represented trust in a different sort of way people felt that you could trust this particular individual and therefore you could trust the medium on which he appeared I remember the first time I ever heard John Peel I was in Birmingham I used to live in a place called Handsworth and Handsworth was a place where we ate Jamaican, we slept Jamaican, we drank Jamaican, we listened to Jamaican music. And I went to the other side of Birmingham, Mosley, and went into a guy's house, a white guy, and he was playing all this strange music on the ra from the radio. And then immediately afterwards, this like really deadpan voice went, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Misty and Roots for you. He just did it so naturally, so normal. He didn't make a big thing out of it. He didn't go, yeah, now we've got some reggae. You know, he was just, and now he was Mr. In Roots. And, and then he, he commented on what Mr. In Roots was saying, and I thought, I remember thinking, there are white people that like us. I had him synonymous with that kind of handheld transistor with a single earplug radio thing. I mean, I was at boarding school, so. It was just lovely to be able to listen to something that had a, that, that, it was quite freeing, quite liberating. He, he, he was a world outside of this odd situation I was within. And he became a sort of de facto big brother for those of us that didn't have one. Peel felt like the vital link. In the days before internet, um, the likes of me 
and my pals clinged to Peel for information, entertainment, um, everything. He was a, a lifeline. Although John rubbed shoulders with lots of stars, getting close to them wasn't the point. I don't really have a relationship with bands. I mean, after, I'm a 55-year-old bloke, you know, with four children. I live out in the country near Ipswich. Uh, so you're not going to find, like, a bunch of 18-year-olds who are just uh, discovering, you know, uh, their way in the world of uh, pop. Uh, they're not going to want to come and hang out with John Peel, very reasonably. I don't blame them at all. Instead, he hung out at home with his children and wife, Sheila. Often he never met the artists he championed. It was their music he was interested in. Maybe as a person, he was, a, he was more reserved and, you know, I think he voiced his love and showed his appreciation by, you know, playing the music. And that's just the truth, man. It's like, for real, he, that's, you know, that's how I think he knew me. You know, I would be in my house and I'd switch the radio on, like, uh, 8, 9 o'clock in the evening and he would be playing one of my records and he would be talking about it as if he knew me. And I think that's a personal touch and that's because he actually listened to my music and I, I'm, I'm proud of that, you know. My relationship with, with John Peel goes back on, on very much a professional level. Um, I didn't hang out with John or I didn't really know him outside of, the, uh, outside of those sort of things that we were doing. I found John Peel very shy, um, to me, um, and I'm very shy. I think we were just very sort of shy and deferential to each other, actually, um, on the times that I, that I met him. The first time I ever met John was when I was doing an interview with David Kidd Jensen. John was kind of moseying around through the glass, getting his show together. You know, I was, I was on air, but I was thinking, bloody hell, that's John Peel, you know, there he is. So he came in anyway, said hello, and, um, and he was, you know, he's really, you know, what everyone knows, about him really self-effacing and very kind of droll and kind of dour but funny you know he didn't play our records because we were mates we didn't meet him until a long time after he'd been really hammering our records hello again millions of listeners on tonight's program we have a session for you from new fast automatic daffodils their first for the program we were both quite shy around each other i saw him not that long ago actually i was driving down great portland street and um, he was standing waiting to cross the road and I waved at him really, really enthusiastically. And he smiled and he nodded. <laughs> and I just thought it was like, you know, the master of understatement in a way. But it made, you know, it was so nice to see him there and smiling back. No matter how famous he got, John never really saw himself as a star. As a young fan, Ken Garner asked him for an interview for his student paper. He genuinely seemed rather faintly surprised faintly pleased and rather embarrassed that we wanted to spend some time with him, you know, for you know, three uh, spotty people, uh, young students from Glasgow, can we take you for a curry job? Yeah, fine, all right, you know, just perfectly happy, bumbling, and uh, would answer our questions and so on, and was perfectly happy, you know, it's like very, very non-celeb, very non-media, as everyone says, he genuinely was like that. Yeah, that sound awful like some terrible Bob Hope thing, you know, like a lot of my best friends are my listeners. Uh, and of course you try and approach Bob and you get beaten senseless. Uh, Hi Bob, I'm one of your best friends. Bang! Like there's some security bloke jump on top of you. But uh, uh, enough people, you know, have written and uh, become pals uh, to make the mail something that I look forward to. I remember being at Glastonbury and seeing people go up to John and like, they'd be shaking with like, I don't know, excitement, fear, a combination of the two at meeting him. And there'd be this odd... He was very good at bringing, sort of decompressing people as they came up by being just relentlessly ordinary with them. You trot along beside him and uh, go and see some of these bands. Uh, maybe the most noticeable thing, and he would have hated it completely, he was the person most people in that place were looking at. And I don't think he would have any real sort of belief that it was the case, but I mean, people held their breath when they walked past. And I mean, every person that has met John Peel remembers what they said to him. And I always remember even just walking around the streets and people, 16 year olds or whatever, would be stopping him and said, hey John, how you doing? Blah, blah. And he'd always have time for somebody to speak to them. You know, he really, he always had time for people. And he never wanted to, he basically, he never wanted to disappoint anybody, let them down in any way. And he used to say to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. There's so much to listen to. And it's true. And there's only so many hours in the day. And, I mean, other people would tell you, you know, you'd have headphones on all the time. You'd be just always listening. Um, 
uh, and that was a, a kind of panic would take over. You'd think, well, what am I going to do? I, what, what? And you'd think this this is part of of, of the tunes, and you know, some they're all going, please listen to me, help me, you know. And so you didn't want to miss anything. And I, I know that's what he felt, and, and it would get him very upset a lot of the time because what could you do? He did his best. He was an open door for listeners to the programme, helping many bands get started. I used to you know, run bands and run clubs you know, in the 80s, and um, I didn't have a phone in the house, but you used to be able to phone his show and get through, so you could catch him in between records. So when the record came on, I used to run down to get the payphone and ring his number. You know, if you held on, you got through. I said, oh, John, I've got, the, I've, I've got this uh, gig coming up. It's the Wasp Factory. We're doing, a, um, you know, we're doing the Kitchens of Distinction and Frank Sightbottom at such and such a venue, you know, and we've got, you know, we're playing great music. And um, you know, any chance you could mention it? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I can do that, you know. And you think, right, right. And then, so you put the phone down to run back up to the house. You just get there and type at the end of the record, switch it on. Just had a call there from uh, Stuart Murdoch in Glasgow, and he's at the Wasp Factory Disco on Friday night. You know, and I thought that's cool. <laughs> John gave a leg up to the undertones too. We sent him a demo tip with a letter. And he never replied until, I think it took about two months later, something like that, he wrote a really nice letter. Dear Undertones, I've behaved like a typical music business arsehole over your tape, and I'm genuinely sorry about this. Really like the tape, I think you should record a session for us. John Peel, the world's most boring man. I can't afford you to come over to London to do a session, but I'd like to actually pay, I'll pay for it myself, for you to go do it in Northern Ireland if you can. It's incredible for somebody like John Peel to do that, you know, dip into his own pocket. So consequently, we did the four songs, and he did, he did broadcast it within a couple of weeks. Oh, right. I've lost the stamp that said John Peel, the world's most That's boring man. man. <laughs> <laughs> now welcome to the car smack. When we came over here, we had a lot of trouble getting concerts. We had a lot of tr trouble getting any kind of recognition whatsoever. We were largely dismissed by the, the media as, um, as just this sort of wacky novelty band from Australia or something like that. Um, and John Peel really liked us, and he, and he played us over and over and over again. Um, we did four Peel sessions with him. Um, and, you know, really, if it wasn't for that support, I don't know what we would have done, really. But John had his own heroes. When it came to football, he was the eternal fan. Liverpool have won the double. We would just sit and talk football, and he'd talk about Liverpool uh, constantly. And it was the only time I ever saw him animated when he was talking about Liverpool. Uh, you know, and he said that the highlight of his sporting life was the 1981 Cup Final, European Cup Final in Paris, and he, he had a drink with Bill Shankly, and Bill Shankly um, said, can you get my bag there, John? And it was it was uh, the ultimate for John Peel, you know, to be taking Bill Shankly's bag because he regarded Bill Shankly as a god. He was a Liverpool supporter, and it was lovely when they were in the Premier Ipswich, and Liverpool played um, Ipswich. Sheila sat with the Ipswich supporters and John sat with the Liverpool supporters and I just thought that was amazing. <laughs> really, really sort of like, you know, they were true supporters of their teams. One of the most amazing things done is uh, the FA Cup final in 1989. Oh, beautifully done. If you're in the Cup final, you want your friends and your family to be there. And of course, I asked John to come along with Sheila. I was playing for Everton and uh, John's a Liverpool fan, <laughs> and of course, in the middle of all the Everton fans, John turned up with his red scarf for Liverpool. I wouldn't have expected anything else from John. He did have a great knowledge of football, you know, and, and when you sit and listen to him, he would be very, very passionate. Well, I'm supposed to be an expert, but he's the expert and I'm the listener about what's happening at Liverpool, where it's gone wrong, where it's gone right. He would tell me what was happening in the football world. I couldn't tell him what was happening in the music world, because of what he said to me, what, what's your taste in music? <laughs> I said, I love Billy Joel. And he went, can't see it, can't see 
<laughs> I said, oh, well, thanks very much. You know, I think he sold about like 60 million records, but does that not count? Not to him, it didn't. If he didn't like him, he didn't like him. It's pointless trying to plug John Peel. He will listen to what he wants to listen to and make up his own mind. And that doesn't really deviate. And you can't really say to him, you're wrong, you don't like that. Because it's all about his personal taste. And that's why we loved him. Hello and welcome back to Glastonbury, where it is not at the moment raining, which is quite exciting in itself. And we know enough from the outside world about what's going on to know that England won 2-0. No goals for Mike alone, but in the next match, and of course, let's hope that Glenn Hoddle sticks with Steve McManaman as well. He takes your advice, doesn't he? He does. Like he, he really does. does. He should. I was one of the really lucky ones because I got to spend an awful lot of time with John when we were doing the Glastonbury TV coverage and I count myself as really privileged to have done that. My memories of that are uh, he'd be on the Red Wine, I'd be on the Jack Daniels and we'd also have quite a few heated debates about different bands. I'd be sort of getting really excited about who was on the main stage, the headline act, you know, oh, R.E.M. are on stage or Coldplay are on stage and he'd be going, <laughs> yeah, mm. and just grumbling because John, John grumbled, he was good at grumbling and uh, he'd be like, you know, I don't know what you see in them and then he'd be shouting about Kando Bongo Man or somebody com completely obscure that I knew nothing about. His musical taste was his own. There was no way he could second guess it. He'd play Junior Biles and then he'd play a techno record by Richie Horton then he'd play a band from Wales called Melis, which no one else had heard of. It's a remarkable juxtaposition of different musics. He championed a lot of movements over the years, you know, not just punk, but hip hop as well. And in fact, uh, this very important thing about, um, I think he got more complaints from irate listeners about playing hip hop, dance, black music, whatever, than he did about playing punk music. I think he was partly responsible for helping, uh, you know, people on Radio One listen to drum, drum and bass and jungle and techno and house music. I think dance music in general, John Peel would take that gamble. He obviously had idiosync very idiosyncratic tastes, you know, that, that were particular to, to him. And that's, ju that's just what he was going to play, and that was that. And, uh, and, that was, and luckily, it was, he had good taste, so, so it was enjoyable to listen to. I, I just never ceased to amaze me, the breadth of what he would play, you know, be some sort of 1950s piece of music, and there'd be, you know, something from 2004, and it would work. He would, you know, and this, this extraordinary, how can one person have that such, I don't know, where it came from to have that exquisite taste? I mean, some people said, yeah, but most, are oh, lots of it's unlistenable. But they didn't mind, people didn't mind that, because in between there'd be this absolute gems. The fact was, if he was just another bloke playing this kind of music, he wouldn't, it, you wouldn't listen to it all the time. You wouldn't put up with the dross that he used to play, you know, a lot. You know, it's, you, you know for the, the one in three, the one in four in, interest in, in the breathtaking records, you know, unless you had that little the personality, um, the, the, the ease that he put you at. You know. The thing is, if he played something bloody awful and you'd be listening and, ah, oh, you know, three minutes of feedback and, you know, a Scottish accent squealing at you, you'd, you'd, you'd weather that because you knew around the corner, well, what's next? There was a constant box of delights. If you can get a lot of people listening to Captain Beefheart, whether they listen to him because it's a cult thing or because they really listen, it doesn't really matter that much because if they listen to it as a cult thing, then the chances are they'll get into it properly eventually anyway. But if you can do something like that, you know, it's worth all the ludicrous uh, nonsense you have to go through to do it. He said quite recently to me, and this is so simple and so true, he said, I am just, I just want to hear something I've never heard before. And that's it, really. That, that you can sum up what his quest musically was all about. He would be listening for something exactly that isn't a, a copy, that, isn't, that, you know, that hasn't been done before. The thing about Peel is, at his best, is... Every record challenges the assumptions of the one before. You hear a record, you think, oh, that's nice. Well, that's quite good. And then you're immediately challenged. Say it's some nice kind of folky thing or some indie pop jangly thing. Well, do that, do that, do that. Ooh, you think, hey, that's nice pop music. And then you go, do, 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 do. And you think, yeah. And you think, well, ah, now I like both of these, but how do I feel about that? And that's the reaction he wanted. No other DJ does that. No other DJ in the world does that. That's him, that's, that's, what, that's what we've lost. And one of the records he wanted to hear was Stiff Little Fingers, Nobody's Hero, and there's a version of it that occurs uh, rather neatly on a Peel Sessions LP, which I'm about to play in now. It wasn't only the music, it was his delivery that charmed people. John Peel was one of the great broadcasters because he had that extraordinary ability to be himself. You had the sense with John that when he was 
broadcasting to the nation, to millions of people, he was exactly the same person that he was, had been, 10 minutes earlier when he was talking to somebody who just bought him a cup of coffee in the office or bumped into somebody on the way into the studio that morning. He was himself. There was no side. The, the, the person you heard on radio, he just spoke like that off radio. Uh, you didn't feel that he was, um, he certainly wasn't packaged, he certainly didn't hype himself up. He, I don't even think he would call himself a great DJ. You know, he, he was a bloke that played records. And it was, to a certain extent, like going to a bloke's house or a bloke coming out to your house and saying, you know, listen to these tunes that I like, Benjamin, you know, see what you think of them. You were sitting listening to him in the car, then you thought, hey, wait a minute, he's talking to me here. And, and that, was, that was a great style. And, it was one of his best attributes that, that he could sort of, you know, sit in front of a microphone and be just absolutely relaxed and talk as though he was talking in, in a pub with six mates. And now from a knave, me, to a queen, Annie Nightingale. This self-deprecating humour, the playing the records at the wrong speed, sometimes the playing the, the things at the on you know uh, the, the wrong side and being a you know a human being he was so the opposite of you're a slick dj you know he was it, it, it just so determinedly himself sometimes you hear people described as having a bit of a john peel voice which is a kind of that soft burr to it but also just that slightly lugubrious but not depressing way of speaking and at one time DJs all had to talk like that you know all right mate not up very you know talk very quickly up to the vocal all those things not say er uh, or pause for thought it was considered more important to talk without stopping rather than stopping briefly and think about what you were going to say as well it's quite plain and nothing that I can do here to, to help is there that's patently obvious I think. and all the time there was John just talking about what he wanted to talk about and stopping and saying uh, and pausing and just getting it. And, you know, we all thought, well, I say we all, speaking for us all, but I thought, and I know lots of other people, he was the one who said, no, well, you can do it this way. It, it's, it's a funny one, really, the idea of a reticent DJ, you know. And uh, obviously, I th he could have only come out of the UK. Um, he always struck me as having this kind of... Um, mixture of self-depreciation and self-assurance as well. The more I talk, uh, then the fewer records I can play, so I'll try and keep the chat to a minimum. So it may seem strange that he's been doing a show that's all talk, home truths, but it does make sense. He actually liked home. He actually loved his family. He liked his house. It was a very important place for him. So I think it was natural for him to do home truths. I remember when he first did it, some people said, what's he doing that for, what, you know, what's that about? And I said, well, that's about him. Just, just like he wasn't putting on a show when he did you know, his Radio 1 show, he's not putting on a show now, this is about him. I thought it was very cool that uh, his uh, home life was very openly important to him. He's a real champion for uh, domesticity uh, as cool, you know. I don't know whether that's been done with uh, quite as much style. Hello and welcome to Home Truths, a name chosen only when it became an administrative impossibility for programme planning to continue without a name. It's a great skill to be able to talk to people out there, put them at their ease, to make them feel entirely unselfconscious and just to get them talking about themselves unselfconsciously. Uh, it, he could do that. By God, he could do that. Recently, the worlds of his music and his domesticity came together when he started to broadcast live from home. Chris was in the bathroom. We had to put Chris with his keyboard setups in the toilet, and obviously we had uh, hilarity every time. You know, he'd flush the, the bathroom every time he was like playing a solo or something. I was kind of standing on some stairs to sing, and John was over at the desk with the with a microphone. But it's also a bonus when you get to meet him because he's instantly entertaining, uh, you know, just uh, story after story and, um, and he did that, that angle that he, he puts on, on things. One of those responsible for John's favourite song was invited to his birthday party. 
I was thinking, you know, what can I give John Peel as a special 60th birthday present? In my attic, I ha ha happen to have um, the actual original lyrics of Teenage Cakes written by my brother John with corrections, things scored out and stuff. So I looked at that. Uh, I think John will like, John Peel will like this. So we got it framed and we presented it to him before, you know, the actual party. And I just remember he looked at it and he went, oh my goodness, or something like that, words to that effect. And he, he just disappeared into his house. And he came back about 10 minutes later and, and he had, I could tell he'd been crying. He had like all these red marks around his eyes. And I think it was nice. <laughs> It's hard to imagine who might replace John Peel. It's hard to imagine anybody that's got that kind of um, width and breadth of musical taste, really. Somebody that would have the nerve to play Gene Vincent, you know, next to the block party. I mean, that takes quite a lot of courage or bloody mindedness. I miss him because we need people with passion and bravery and good taste. I like one offs as well. That's kind of perfect that he was a one-off, right? There was no real protege waiting in the wings. I mean, that was the great thing about John. He said that he was the luckiest man alive with Sheila and the kids, and he just en enjoyed every minute of his life. And um, to die at the age of 65 is unbelievable. It is so tragic. I don't think that the true impact of, of John's passing has been felt yet. You know, in in about a year, we will realise the massive void that's been left. And a lot of people, since the last week, have said, we, are, we all went out and got terribly drunk last night to, we could, to help us through this. And I don't think he'd have minded that. And he could have quite, you know, said, well, OK, yeah, as long as you're having a decent bottle of Rioja. He was a voice that we needed. He was there for the people, for real, man. He was, you know, was, we lost one. That's just the way it is. But I'll smile for him, you know what I mean? I will, I'll smile for him. We lost one, man. So there you go, that's the John Peel that those people knew. I know that everybody has their own different memory and their own different story of John. We're going to go back now to a programme that was made for his 60th birthday. It's called Turn That Racket Down. This is John's version of events. This is kind of his story in his own words. I think you should remember John this way. <laughs> 